Web DM. I'm Pruitt. Hi! And this is Jim, and today we're gonna talk about halflings. If you couldn't tell by our stature, we're imposing figures that are gonna win your hearts and steal your gold. Ha ha ha! Jim, we should probably talk about halflings at some point, right? They're on the player's handbook. They sort of make up the last of the classical demi-human. The Tolkien. Small races are one of those kind of things that's yeah. like, how many do we need? Well, I've got gnomes and goblins and kobolds and halflings. And I do think that they get forgotten about and sort of like yeah. lots of effort gets put in the humans and then less and less for maybe elves and dwarves. And by the time we get to like halflings and gnomes and right, I mean, yeah. this show is just about halflings. We will have a show on gnomes. By the time we get to them, they're just sort of like, eh. They travel around. They travel around. They live in this one area. <laughs> yeah, but mostly they like, they're just, they're just nomads. I, I want to see more thought and effort put into where all of the different fantasy races fit into a D&D &D world. And mm -hmm. I, I'm sure that there are people out there who have elaborate homebrew sort of explanations for them. But, it, but in the base settings for Dungeons and Dragons, the... Yeah the halflings do seem to get kind of forgotten about and yeah. just sort of lumped in with humanity. It's like, oh, wherever you can find humans, there are halflings. And Why don't they measure up? Hmm? Well, Why do they fall short, so I, to speak? I kind of think that this is going to be a, a pun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. It's ironically I'll, pun I'll heavy. I'll brace myself. Yeah, you <laughs> There's a... Uh, Trav left the room, so... He left the room. There's no one to rein you in. Nope. <laughs> There's no one to push the little button on the electric collar that you Why have. Why has it got to be little? You. Huh? It's got to be little. Just because we're talking about anyway. Just because we're talking about halflings. The legacy of the Hobbit. Yes. Right? And, and of Hobbits as a, a a thing that influenced Dungeons and Dragons. Obviously, in like original, original Little Brown Books D&D, &D, they're, they're actually called Hobbits. Uh, and then until... Uh, they had to uh, stop that for, uh, yeah, for until, copyright purposes. Yeah, until we invented, invented copyright lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> we invented them just for hobbits yeah. <laughs> and Dungeons and Dragons, folks. Thanks. Um, and so I think that I, I like them. They're classic, and who wouldn't want to live in the Shire, right? Like, it's the best place to live in Middle Earth. It it's seems, pretty fucking idyllic, right? It, right, you know, you can live in, I would love to live in a hobbit hole. And just, you know, you open a little round door and it's underneath the hill. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's just, it's sort of idyllic and pastoral and obviously is channeling sort of like the English conception of themselves in merry old England. And, oh, yeah. and, and so I, I think that having them in your Dungeons and Dragons world, if only so that you can inflict horrific atrocities on those, uh, on those uh, poor hobbits yeah. that living in their shire is, a, um, is worthwhile to consider. And so in, yeah. in my... Own campaign worlds, I almost always try to find a place where there is a Shire-like environment, where where the, the people that live there, whether it's humans and halflings in, in side by side, mm -hmm. or or it's just kind of like, um, yeah, there you know there here's a human village and and downstream is the halfling village or something like that. But they're sort of like live live side by side and are aware of each other and, and sort yeah. of intermingle. There's a legacy of the Hobbit. Uh, somewhat, but I, I don't find a lot about The Hobbit that makes itself to 5th edition halfling. Right, 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 because like in literature, like you look at, say, Regis. Right. Regis from the from the Driss novels. I uh -huh. mean, he seems very Hobbit-like. Yes. He just wants to sit there, just wants to sit there make and... his scrimshaw mm -hmm. carvings, mm -hmm. and sit by the water, fish, and do nothing. And do nothing. Doesn't want to go in the Underdark, doesn't want to mess with demons yeah. from the Abyss, or, yeah. or anything like that. Just wants to, to be there. So I, I really do see the kinder from Dragonlance as being the true sort of uh, spiritual ancestors of the fifth edition, I think I felt, I think I felt the <laughs> internet shake with anger, and uh, you know I, I I really do because they are adventuring halflings, and there's yeah. nothing about the fifth edition halfling that suggests they would rather be at home, doing nothing. Right. And, you know, and so all of the races have a reason for being out in the world. They have a reason for adventuring, and and it's kind of hard to have a, a hobbit adventurer, right? Like all of the in the books, they're forced out or tricked into going out, or yes, or sort of like reluctantly take up a cause. They just want to stay home, and uh, they just want to stay home, and they just want to be barefoot and pregnant with the last meal, <laughs> right? Like that's with their literally food babies. yeah, with their food babies. Uh, <laughs> And that's really all they want. Kinder have a, a greater influence on 5th edition uh, yeah. than, than perhaps we might realize. And of course, the Kinder have a well-deserved 
off bad the reputation, right, bad reputation, <laughs> off yeah. the line. Our viewers who might not know, Kinder are along with Gully Dwarves and um, I forget, Tinker Gnomes. Tinker Gnomes, yeah. They're sort of the three legacy legacy races from Dragonlance mm -hmm. that kind of get sometimes get brought into other Dungeons and Dragons settings. And for the Kinder specifically, they were like kleptomaniac on cocaine. On cocaine, <laughs> right? They're just like to the extreme, utterly fearless. And they gave license to a certain type of player to be an asshole, yeah, and to make life difficult for their uh, for their fellow players. And I think that's where the problem is: is that they created a race that was like, do you like to be disruptive? Do you like to steal stuff? From your steal stuff from your players, from your fellow players. Uh, then play a kinder, and you can just say, well, I'm just playing my character. <laughs> and that's never an excuse to be a jerk. That's yeah. never an excuse to be disruptive. Well, but it also, those books gave those players every excuse that you need right. to, to do that type of behavior <laughs> and to get away with it, so to speak. Because right. there's a certain naivete of kinders where it's like... I'm not stealing uh, anything. They're, they're oblivious to the, right. the concept of ownership. Yes. Right? So yeah. they're like, oh, I was just found this. Like, yeah, you yep. found it in my pocket. It was like, well, somebody else could have found it and actually stole it. You better be glad better I found this for you. And it's like, oh, God, I hate you. <laughs> yeah, and then, of course, there's the Tasselhoff Burfoot, sort of the archetypal kinder mm -hmm. who uh, who accompanies the uh, the heroes of the Lance. And I, I found them. I've never actually played in a campaign with someone who was playing a kinder, but I've heard a lot of stories. There are people in our gaming group who would, who would uh, experience that themselves. And just sort of looking at them was kind of like, uh, just, they don't seem heroic to me. They don't seem adventuresome, they seem annoying, and, and, and more of a, a party mascot than a full yeah. contributing member. Unlike the Halflings in 5th edition, I think, they, I think they did a good job of sort of, of, of distilling the kinder down to what was most interesting about them. Their fearlessness, their yes. wanderlust, yes. Their, their want to run with the big dogs, as it were, yeah. and sort of scrubbed them of everything that was disruptive and annoying and said like, okay, here's a new version of the Halfling that we're going to yeah. present to you. Pretty sure it's as far back as third edition, but I might be misremembering there. Well, in the player's handbook, you know, you have your two, you have your light foot and your stout, but that, like you're talking about, that base ability, the the advantage versus fright, being frightened. Mm -hmm. That's that's your that's your leftover. Like, yeah, they're they're just not that scared. You right. know, in in Dragonlance, it was more of just like that concept just didn't exist. Fear just doesn't exist in the which mind. Begs Fear is the, the mind killer. Which begs the question of how there are any kinder left at all. Well, if none of if they can't experience fear because fear is a useful emotion. Yes. And it's a, it's a, it's a useful survival tool. Yes. Fear and pain are the two illusions that promote self-preservation. <laughs> right? right. <laughs> it can get out of hand, but it's, it's in, in the healthy doses it's a uh, useful thing. Baseline halflings they're sort of a, a bit fearless. They're yeah. lucky. Yeah, they got you. The, uh, love the lucky ability. Mm -hmm. You know, be able to roll those 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 ones. Yeah. And and their nimbleness, the fact that they're since they are small, you can move through another creature space, which that 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 can behoo. That, that's a good thing for a party when you have your halfling rogue trying to go up and get your sneak attack. Well, they come between right. the fighter's legs. Come between the fighter's legs. Use the use the big hulking uh, barbarian or, or, or mm -hmm. warrior's uh, you know mass to kind of hide behind. Coupled with, I think there's the, the light foot ability that lets them the naturally stealthy. Naturally stealthy. They're, that sort of lends themselves to mm -hmm. roguish pursuits, mm -hmm. uh, stealthy pursuits. And and I think that like if if I think you know the number of halfling rogues out there probably exceeds the other classes that they play, I bet. Yeah, combined. Uh, <laughs> combined, combined probably. Uh, well, because also the stout offers another way to think right. about the same rogue. I mean, with those, adva those advantages versus poison and resistance to poison, now you have your halfling assassin right. who poisons his own dagger and he's so good at it that he doesn't even care if he sticks himself right. because it doesn't matter. Right, it doesn't matter. He's, he's, got, he, he's got resistance to it. And I can even see sort of like a, a halfling poisoner who's a cook. Yeah. Watching someone else go through culinary school and sort of talk about all the different foodborne diseases you can get mm -hmm. and food poisoning and all the foods mm -hmm. that are poisonous it's themselves, it really makes you go like, man, there should be more Dungeons and Dragons adventures built around a, a culinary assassin who, <laughs> you know, who <laughs> finds a way to slowly poison the food over time yeah. or, or to trick his opponents uh, into, into eating rotten or poisonous food. And yeah. I think the halfling would be a good, if yeah. not uh, culprit, then certainly a scapegoat for, uh, for that kind of uh, creature. But also I'm pretty sure that Frodo was a, uh, was a stout halfling because it's the only way he could have survived. Uh, Bearing the ring. Well, no, uh, being uh, oh, stabbed by, by the, uh, uh, the Morgul blade. Yeah, no, well, no, the, the spider. <laughs> the 
one. Oh, the spider. Yes, the, uh, he really gets roughed up in that. No, he gets his <laughs> ass kicked. <laughs> no, he gets his ass kicked. Um, but you know, he he, he survives that. Uh huh. When you're thinking about being a halfling, yeah, and going on your adventure, and you don't want to be the rogue. You know, I'm yeah. not going to be the rogue. Right. What do you play as your halfling? I kind of like having uh, my halflings be casters. To me, that's a holdover from uh, days of playing third edition, where there were benefits that a halfling got because they were a halfling, and then there were the benefits they got because they were small. Right. Right. Like the AC boost, the hit bonus, uh, those kinds of things that really lended me to think like, okay, well, they make really good casters. Harder to hit, easier to hit with certain spells that they have. And so I tend to think of like casters as being halflings, but I also like the sort of juxtaposition of having a warrior halfling, whether they're a barbarian or a paladin or, or a fighter or something mm -hmm. that that really goes like, yeah, I might be small, but this, but this axe still hurts when I hit you with it. I, I can still use the reach of a spear <laughs> to uh, to take out uh, the larger uh, larger opponents. Yeah, and also the fact that 5th uh, edition has kind of gotten rid of those those vestiges of, of like weapon size damage and right. what, what size weapon you can use as a smaller yeah. creature. Now you still, it's harder to use like, uh, what is it, anything that's heavy. I think it's, yeah, it would take disadvantage from that, but you can always just say like, okay, well I have a long sword and use it two handed. Right, that, well, like that's, a D, you know, a D10 is still a, a respectable damage or a battle axe that you use two handed. That's a, It's a different character, but that's what my gnome paladin uses, just a battle axe yeah. that they wield two handed. Can't get, you know, great axe, great sword, maul going yeah. on, but you can get uh, you know, use a versatile weapon uh, two-handed if that's the kind of thing you're going for. Exactly. I mean, that's what I did. I, long-time viewers of the show, know exactly where I'm going to go here with my halfling barbarian, Roscoe Three Stone. But that's what I did with him when I moved him over into fifth edition. And actually, played him. I just went with a long sword because versatile. Think about this: one d10 versus two d6. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a little bit bigger, smaller damage, and a little bit bigger upper end damage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when you crit, you're getting 3 to 18 versus 2 to 20. Right. You literally can do more damage with a longsword two-handed. Two-handed, yeah. Just because the way crit works. Just the I mean? way crit works, but you there's a possibility to do more damage. Right. So, yeah, just pick up a longsword. And that way, I mean, it is the most ubiquitous weapon in the game. Long That's swords, true. right? That's very true. Yeah. So, as a halfling, you got a longsword strapped across <laughs> your back. It's going to be pretty imposing. Right. Uh, and we saw that again in our Spelljammer campaign where uh, we, had, we had a halfling fighter in there, Andarius. It was one of those things where the character was introduced kind of mid-campaign. The player of, of the the warlock, or the warforged uh, transmuter was like, ah, Transmuter state never leaves the ship, constantly tinkering and experimenting yeah. with things. And then, so we wanted a character who we could take on the shore leave, basically. Mm -hmm. And so, Halfling Fighter there turned out to be just a beast. In oh, combat. <laughs> oh no, he 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 fucks you because he was a battle master. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And he he used uh, he and he also used uh, he was a pole arm, right? I think it was two either a long sword or a pole arm. Uh, one of those two, definitely a two handed. Yeah, no, uh, he was a great weapon user. Episodes. Yeah. Uh, and so he yeah he used uh, and. He he used it to a, to great effect. Yeah. Uh, there were quite a bit of quite a bit of fights that y'all went into, and I was just like, "Oh, let's see how this does." And it's like, "Oh, well, yeah, I did just like anyone else." It just it doesn't really matter. I mean, it really is just like you're small. That's the thing about races in Dungeons and Dragons that I find in Fifth Editions, particular, that I really like is that they're a light flavoring to the class. There, are, There's a lot of role-playing uh, aspects to the race that you choose, mm -hmm. uh, and there are obviously some benefits and synergy between race-class combos, but if you go outside those synergies, you're not gonna have a character that's useless. Right. And you can play a small fighter or a small or something, barbarian. or a small barbarian, or conversely, you can play a, a half-orc wizard. And, and sort of like playing against type like that is facilitated by the rules and you can still have an effective character that contributes and that has memorable moments and you feel like is effective. I see like the halfling barbarian and halfling fighter very much in that in that respect. Looking at the data for people that have created uh, characters on D&D Beyond, you can see that like the top three, or the sort of the bottom three for halflings are wizards, paladins, and warlocks. And kind of like looking at them, it's like, Really? I would think that there'd be a ton of, of mm -hmm. halfling wizards. Now, for me, that's because I love the movie Willow. And it's my favorite fantasy movie of all time, full yeah. stop, bar none. It's an amazing movie. I love it. You've never seen it. You should go watch it right now. And yeah. the way that they portray the Nelwyn there as sort of like living in seclusion from the Daikini, the, the big people. They have a magical tradition, obviously. But I like the idea of like a rustic halfling wizard. Yeah. that travels the dusty byways of, of the county and plies their trade to the, the small folk, both figuratively and literally, mm -hmm. of the uh, region that they live. It kind of surprised me. It took me off guard. I'd be like, really? No, Halfling Wizard is down yeah. at the bottom? Picking something like that and, and playing against type 
-hmm. is is fun, makes for an interesting character, and makes for a character that would be memorable and, and still be effective. Yeah. But then again, Halfling Rogue, there's a reason why they're so popular, and because they make really good rogues. Yeah, that hiding, the, the dex boost, I mean, all, pretty much all of it. Well, and then there's another thing about halflings, is because they're small, if you play, like, say, a halfling ranger, and you go beastmaster, you're able to then ride your animal companion, which is something that a medium-sized ranger beastmaster is not able to do. Yep, I was just about to go there. You can go, you, <laughs> you know, in a, in a, I was having a debate on a character to play, uh -huh. and I wanted to, I was like, oh my god, if I went, female halfling with a wolf, I could be Princess Mononoke. <laughs> she rides her freaking wolf into battle with her spear. Uh -huh. She's got a fucking mask on. Yep. I would even like make that mask into a shield that she could right. use. So occasionally right. she rips the mask off and uses it as a shield to get a little bonus to AC. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But that. why wouldn't you ride your fucking wolf into battle? Yeah, why and you're getting you? all those bonuses. Go Sentinel. So you, yeah. you and your wolf are just like <laughs> stabbing and fighting. Uh, I mean, come on. But the, the visuals of it and the and the, the, the sort of the, the potential for for um, you know, to have an animal companion that you're more closely bonded with because you're able to ride it because it's it's sort of there with you always, as opposed to say like a, a medium-sized ranger that takes a bear or a boar or something mm -hmm. like that that maybe isn't always appropriate for them to, uh, to to follow the party around. The smaller ranger is able to say like, well, yeah, my animal is a bit more manageable and I'll just hop on it yeah. and ride it around. It's easier to navigate the tight corridors of a dungeon with something like that. The visual imagery of it, mm -hmm. the riding around on a wolf or a big cat or something like that is uh, really fun. Or even just going something weird and having like giant ape and you sit in a harness on its back mm -hmm. and using your uh, your bow as you uh, as, as it cavorts around the battlefield. Yeah, <laughs> as you are the C-3PO to its Chewbacca. Right. Or the brand or it's, to its Hodo. Hodo. Right, or its uh, master to the blaster. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think that um, I, I think that those are the kind of character archetypes that I can see. I can really think of probably uh, a halfling for every uh, for every class mm -hmm. in well, that respect. Well, and, you have mentioned uh, a few times before your your halfling wizard idea. Right. I think is great. And yeah. Go through that right quick. Uh, so my halfling wizard idea, and I haven't had a chance to play this yet, but it, it is one where I wanted to take the D20 and go like, you know, I'm going to think every way that I can manipulate this D20, whether one that I roll or one that my enemies roll, I'm going to take with this Halfling Diviner. And, and at the extreme end of it, it was the Halfling Diviner lore wizard with, or lore bard with the, uh, with the lucky feet. But right now it would just be Halfling, first ability score increase, taking lucky, going Diviner all the way, and then mm -hmm. a bit, I'll bump up my int uh, after I get lucky. Uh, and then maybe later on, dipping uh, into bard for cutting words. And just yeah. uh, having a character that can um, manipulate the D20 and, 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 and the interplay between what the D20 represents in character, yeah. right? The D20 is fate. Yes. Luck. Yeah, you're uh, a fate weaver. <laughs> you're right, your skill and being able to manipulate that is one of those where this just halfling just is, is lucky. Yeah. And others around him are lucky. Yeah, and he never loses. I he never loses. It. He's always got it, uh, and always has the right role for the right uh, for the right occasion. And so that's kind of a concept that that that's a blend of a mechanical trick mm -hmm. that that I sometimes make a character on versus a, and, and a concept uh, that I tend to make characters uh, based around that uh, that I really want to try out. Give me an example of a way to view halflings in a war in a world in a setting mm -hmm. that is just completely. Just completely Opposite different from of, what it is. Yeah, right. anything you've ever seen before. What, just walk me through what that would look like. So there's one um, one take on halflings that I cannot remember where I where I read about it or, or saw it. So if our, our viewers out there know, please comment uh, and and we can point people in that direction. The, in the setting, the halflings were the military geniuses. Mm -hmm. of the city and they conquered like half the continent and subjugated all these peoples because mm -hmm. while the half orcs and humans and others do the fighting there's always a halfling general back there somewhere directing yeah. things and moving and they're master manipulators mm -hmm. master strategists yeah. and they've created an empire in which they sit at the apex of it and it's just tiny like apex. the tiny tiny little <laughs> apex of it it's a small seat and so I, I really liked that because I, it was one of those things where it's just like yeah I don't think of halflings as being grand military strategists and and conquerors mm -hmm. I appreciated like that that take on it ever since reading that I've been wanting to find a way to incorporate that idea into a homebrew setting that I create I it's difficult because because the homebrew setting I've been using for so long, I've already kind of established what halflings are like, yeah. but I, I want to find a way to work it in somewhere. 
and yeah. have it be like the, the halflings are the they're like all little Napoleons. <laughs> yeah, tiny, tiny. Well, I mean, just normal Napoleons. Normal but... Napoleons, really. Because <laughs> the way I always see like my character Roscoe is people are terrified of him because he's just like chopping legs off left and right. But like I'm just imagining the armies that fight these halflings, and there's not a lot of like like deaths. <laughs> a lot of casualties, and they all come back with missing a leg. With missing limbs and legs. L missing well, legs. There is something you like know. that, though. Be because the half, because halflings, and I, you could also say the same with, like, gnomes, because yeah. they are childlike. They're yeah. small. You underestimate them. Right. Living with a toddler now is one of those things where I look at him and go, you know, if I gave this kid a sword, that would be terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're, it's, he's so fast. Yeah. <laughs> and, you just, and, the, and you naturally underestimate and you because naturally of that size. Because of that size yeah. that I kind of think uh, that, that you can transport that with uh, into Dungeons and & Dragons and your halflings are similar. A halfling fighter, if you saw a halfling fighter or a barbarian walk up and they've got a weapon as big as they are yeah. and they're fully armored, you go like, it doesn't matter that they're 40 pounds and that you could punt them across the battlefield. They, they're they going to chop your, they're going to take your knee out. They're probably going to take your leg off before that foot makes contact. And right. You still have to make contact, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> right. We've had other halflings that have been played at the table. I'm, I'm thinking of Tomlin. Um, oh, the, the, the Murderer. The murderer. <laughs> the murderous mur who made friends with demons and hung out with, with goblin warlocks uh -huh. and uh, armed with his adamantine daggers was just a, 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 true, uh, a true terror to behold. Yeah. Anything where you, you're playing off the kind of cutesy nature of halflings, that maybe goes more with gnomes, but halflings still have that kind of cutesiness going. Yeah. Playing off of that and saying like, yeah, my 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 person is a sociopath. They they they're a murderer or they are a bloodthirsty warrior. Don't underestimate them. They are a powerful spellcaster. Size matters not to them, right? And 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 those are the kinds of things you can do with halflings that uh, they deserve more attention than just other uh, small yeah. humans. You underestimate them. Well, guess what? That. <laughs> Is why you fail. That is why you <laughs> fail. Um, so yeah, it's always worth uh, spending some time with your halflings and and figuring out where they fit into your world and and the ways in which you can use them in interesting. And besides, uh, it's it's no big feat to do that, right? It's no big feat. See like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they, you were right. Because they have big feet. Because they've got big hairy oh. feet. cheese on those as well. I want flour and I want like cheese added to those. Uh, flour and then can I add cheese to that? No, that's fine. That's fine. No, that, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Two. Scratching your ass. Uh, right, like get, uh, because we don't give a shit. On, uh, on flour. Don't forget my Got a gas coming out my ass. Uh, one because I need so to want. take a shit. No. Uh, Wait, are you rolling? One, uh, one <laughs> <laughs> Singing my song. Bro, what, are one onion and what are we doing? Uh, at this very moment, uh, uh, the intrepid Josh Davis, master of Twitter and purveyor of puns, and is putting in a, uh, an order at... The taco Deli. At, what is it, El Pastor? Taco Deli. Taco Deli. No, somebody ordered the El Pastor. Yeah. I did. Yeah, oh, Travis okay. ordered the El Pastor. I'm, uh, um, I'm a plain Jane kind of guy. I just like right. black beans, yeah. rice, and cheese. Because I don't want to get all rumbly in my tumbly later on. No, that's all. You but, don't want to uh, shit your meal? 